Welcome to MCC at Home. Today, I believe it's uh, it's the 21st. It's our 21st, uh, which I suppose also means that in, in some states of America, we'd be recognized as a legal adult now. How about that? So this is our 21st MCC at Home. In a second, I'll be doing a talk on the unfortunately always relevant topic of suffering. So what does Christianity have to say in the face of suffering? That'll be the first thing. After that, we'll have a catch up with Ian and Meg, part of our church family. And lastly, as per usual, we'll be wrapping up with a quick plug for one of our activities, one of our church related activities that I'm sure will be relevant and maybe of interest to either you or someone who you know. So we've got all that to look forward to. But again, thank you for joining us this morning for MCC at Home. And now, let's talk about suffering. I've got friends, as, as I'm guessing you do too, who have lost loved ones, parents, to sudden and cruel diseases. Now, in some cases, they've been relatively young, and the period between diagnosis and death has been less than 12 months. And again, in some cases, they've been Christians with a sincere faith and serving God seemingly in their prime. And what can make this situation even harder is when other well-meaning Christians inform those who are suffering that they'll be healed, they'll be restored. They're convinced that they've heard from God that there's going to be some kind of complete healing. Now, I'm not discounting miraculous he healings. I believe that they can happen and are worth praying for. But in an instance, in the instance that a Christian is convinced that this is going to happen for someone and broadcast that to the person who is suffering, as well as their loved ones, and then it doesn't happen, the fallout, as you can imagine, can just be devastating and make an already bad situation even worse. So you can see why unjust or, ex or unexplainable suffering is one of the biggest reasons people give for not believing in God, or at least not believing in a good God. Some of my friends who have lost people they don't, they didn't see God in their suffering. They only saw a blind faith that proved a cruel false hope. And maybe you find yourself holding a similar position. So this little talk is going to take a quick look at the big, huge topic of Christianity and suffering. This is only going to scratch the surface, given again, like the potential scope. Now, firstly, if I was trying to defend God in the face of suffering, I could offer a maxim like, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So just because you didn't see God in your suffering, just because he didn't show up and intervene supernaturally, it doesn't mean that he's not there. Now that may be technically correct, and maybe it'd appeal to the detached observer of the human condition. But points like that do little by way of providing comfort to those who are feeling absolutely bludgeoned by life. Christian philosopher Alvin Platinga, he helpfully distinguishes between suffering and evil. He says that suffering encompasses any kind of pain or discomfort, whereas evil is a subset of that that is concerned specifically with free creatures choosing to do what is wrong. So someone engaging, sorry, someone choosing to engage in evil can have tragic and confronting results. I don't want to like, particularly put a timestamp on this talk, but in 2020, it's not hard to find prominent examples of individuals engaging in evil acts that have had far reaching consequences. But despite the needless suffering and pain caused in examples of this type, people can perhaps find some solace in the idea that those engaging in evil are exercising their free will. And hopefully, they'll be held responsible and called to account for doing so. That's your person on the street. Theologians and, Christians and Christian apologists, they also look to this as explaining why an all-powerful and all-loving God can tolerate so much evil in his world. So the argument usually follows the line that a world with creatures who can freely choose to love God 
and to do good entails those same creatures having the capacity to reject God and perpetuate evil. It's just another way of saying we can't have our cake and eat it. We can't expect God to grant us that kind of freedom, but then always intervene and override people's freedom when it suits us. And despite being viewed by Christians as being all-powerful, God cannot contradict himself and give people the freedom to do evil and at the same time stop them from doing so. So that's that. But what about the suffering that erupts outside that category of evil? What about things like natural disasters and hideous diseases that can't be pinned to someone's free will or dubious choices? What about that kind of stuff? Now that would seem to leave all the responsibility with God. So take those examples that I gave at the start of this talk. Many of my friends, and presumably yours, maybe even yourself, would say they can't see any good that a supposed God could bring about by the death of loved ones from, say, cancer at a relatively young age. Now, I know, again, that in theory, this could be countered by suggesting that you can't have your God so big and so transcendent to be angry at for not stopping all the world's suffering and yet... On the other hand, expect to comprehend all the good reasons why he allows it to continue. Another way of saying that is like saying, God, look, I want you to be powerful enough to stop all the needless suffering, but also I want you to be comprehensible and simple enough for me to understand why you allow both the good and bad things to happen. That, to me, sounds like we want a designer God, one who is just slightly more, um, more powerful than ourselves, but no more. Now, regardless, I don't think my friends or yours who have suffered significantly are currently and understandably capable of imagining a future, heavenly or otherwise, that will somehow more than compensate for the losses of their past and likely immediate future. And whilst you know it is often pointed out that those who undergo suffering are radically transformed for the better, we often hear that, and I believe it, there are also those more unnerving accounts of heroes who have found suffering almost overwhelming. But despite all of this, when my friends tell me, directly or not, that God can't exist due to suffering, or if he does, he's certainly not a God who can be trusted, I think that there are at least two responses that are worth considering. And the first one's this. Despite, despite the moments of genuine harrowing suffering we find ourselves in, again, e.g. the sudden or unexpected death of a loved one, Despite how all-encompassing those circumstances can feel completely immersed in feeling overwhelmed, we still experience moments of profound joy and pleasure, often almost simultaneously. So at a loved one's funeral, you may find yourself despairing and baffled at the unfairness of life. But again, almost side by side with that, you'll be proud and moved by how your children are handling the event or you'll feel some overwhelming great uh, gratitude at the love and support that your partner is showing you. Lauren Wilkinson writes this, the question why ought to hover as perplexingly over the pleasures of sex and music as it does over the pains of cancer and starvation. That's so true. Many, if not most of us, have experienced just as much meaningful pleasure and joy as we have profound pain and suffering. And whilst much of the pain can only seem to be attributable to God, the same surely can be said for the joy. So is the God responsible for the, for the inexpressible pleasure you get from your child's smile, the way that that lights you up? Is he deserving of solely hatred or suspicion? That's worth considering. 
But the perhaps even more profound Christian response to suffering is this. Most of us, myself included, disdain hypocrisy. So whilst there are really no watertight theoretical answers as to why God permits suffering, there is something admirable, I'd suggest, about his willingness to assume human form and enter into that suffering in the person of Jesus, who knew a lot, a lot firsthand a lot, about being hunted, betrayed, rejected, abandoned, falsely accused, and finally murdered. If suffering can be described as something so subjective, it's almost as if it occurs behind a locked door of ourselves that we can't undo from the inside, then God entering into it is comparable to opening up that door from the other side. Now, I know this isn't necessarily a tidy answer or response, but perhaps a more profound one. God, in Jesus, steps down from heaven and experiences all the fury of a messed up, imperfect, sometimes beautiful, but always broken world firsthand. And perhaps even more stunningly, Christians dare to believe that he did so out of love for his creation's sake. Now again, this may sound like cold comfort compared to the luxury of a thorough explanation for suffering, but as, as Christian apologist Lee Strobel, I think accurately says, or points out, on an existential level, we humans don't really crave answers when, when acutely suffering, when we're right in the midst, the apex of our suffering. What we want more than anything is a presence. The threat of being alone in our suffering is even more terrifying than a lack of explanation. Jesus, being both man and God, coming to earth, suffering and dying. This demonstrates that God hasn't left us alone in our suffering. But all this I know, understandably, may sound a little bit too esoteric or maybe theoretical for you. So let me encourage you, get along to a church, meet some people, and I think you'll see, you'll maybe even be pleasantly surprised, how God uses those people to be his hands and feet. You'll find people whose experience runs the whole gamut of suffering, sickness, cruel circumstances, failed relationships, etc., etc. You'll find yourself surrounded by those who have had far from perfect lives, but you'll also find that far from despairing or being consumed by their very real and undeniable suffering, the example and the love of Jesus empowers them to endure that as well as being a comfort to others. And I'd suggest that that's even more inspiring and powerful than a neat foolproof answer as to why a good God allows suffering in the first place. Thanks, and as always, please reach out if you've got any questions. Ian and Meg. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. I'm doing well. How about you guys? Yeah, good. Good. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming in. I don't think that you were raised as a Christian, as in you weren't raised in a kind of, uh, I guess, a stereotypically religious family. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and this sort of ties in a bit to, to meeting mm -hmm. uh, Meg and coming to NCC. Mm. Um, yeah, like I sort of... Uh, my my mum would definitely say she's a Christian, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but I think nowadays uh, we refer to them as sort of Christmas and Easter Christians. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of when mum goes to church, and and so she would call herself Catholic, I mm -hmm. think, on that front. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, fairly nominal uh, on that in that area, and. So I guess I didn't necessarily grow up as a Christian. I didn't. Uh, until I met Meg, I actually didn't like Christians very much. Mm -hmm. um, I just found them really hypocritical mm -hmm. and really judgmental. And so I, I looked at quite a range of different religions um, because I looked at Christianity a couple of times and I just went, yeah, no, um, <laughs> don't even like those people. And, and so when I finally met Meg uh, I, and, and found out she was a Christian, I kind of went, oh, okay. And, but I was interested in her enough. That yeah. I, I thought I'd at least give it a, another another go and yeah, actually take sure. a second glance at it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was really it was an interesting conversation um, mm. because when I said, "Oh yeah, look, I'm not really into Christianity for, mm. for all these reasons," she said, 
no, that's not it at all. And I just went, what? Mm. And I said, oh, it's, well, it's this, this, and this. She said, no, you've, you've actually got it wrong. And, and she's actually saying it's more about God's love mm. and, um, and a whole range of things of just how to treat people. And, and I was like, going, that has not been my experience mm. yeah. with Christianity mm. at all up mm. until that date, really. Mm. Mm-hmm. It was just a matter of go to church um, and, and what I'd seen play out, I hadn't been that impressed with. So anyway, I listened to what she had to say. I went, okay, well, I'll go along to one of the, the Bible studies she mm. was attending at the time. I think her aunt was running it at mm. the time. It was through Uniting Church. Yeah, oh, through the Uniting yeah, Church. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, where yeah. you were. Mm. Um, and, and I sort of sat down and read the Bible. I was like, oh, well, at, at, at Bible study. And went, yeah. oh, this is gold. Huh. Like, this is, this is actually really good stuff. So it was really refreshing um, to, to read the Bible and actually have something tangible to, to live your life by yeah. and also go, oh, this is actually a good way to live. Mm-hmm. And so it was at that point certainly in my head that I, I chose Christianity. You've both got uh, two great kids. Yep. And they're both primary school age, so like relatively young. Uh, what are some concrete, and this is like what I'm really kind of key for, I tried to phrase it appropriately, yeah. concrete, specific, if you like, you know, ways in which your faith both informs how you parent and also how you kind of go about family life. In the early days, we listened to a parent training video, mm-hmm. which was by Danny Silk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, of, and we found that really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. It was, I think the timing was right and the content was correct yeah. um, for us at that point in time. And he's teaching or he's teaching series really focused on um, a, a controlled choice. Or, or, yeah. Yeah, controlled like the- Yes. And and that was really helpful with this. Like you can't, a lot of that taught, you can't control anyone. I mean, you can make them submit, you can physically restrain, but you actually mm. can't control them. And so we, we sort of really listened to that. And, and it was very much about having some, giving them options and having, treating them like humans and actually giving them choices, um, but limited choices probably, mm. the, giving yep. them limited choices um, mm. that they can handle. Mm. And, and that was fairly interesting and in a godly way. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was Christian um, parenting dude. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Just yeah. Good. And so that was really helpful and instrumental mm. in, into the way we, we started trying to raise mm. our kids. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that was sometimes difficult too, because if you gave them a range of choices, and you really wanted them to choose B, but they probably chose A or C. You then had to live with A or C. Yeah. And, yeah. and the only thing you really had to stick by was when they came up with D, you go, no, we don't yeah. do D. You've yeah. got A, B or C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. D's off the table. Yeah, D's yeah. off the table. You yeah. want them to choose B, but they're yeah. like, no, we're going with C. Oh, okay, I guess we're going with C then. Yeah, um, yeah but that was it was good. And I think yeah. that's applied for most of our parenting and how we apply yes. our faith. Yes, like um, God doesn't control us, so... Mm. Why on earth do we think we can control our children? You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. like if this we're going to do it, yeah. yeah. If, if we're going to, to be godly parents, then then we need to sort of imitate mm-hmm. God's parenting style. You know, um, so yeah, we try and do that the best we can in terms of not controlling them. You know, um, treating them with respect. They're actually our little brothers and sisters mm-hmm. in Christ. You know. Mm. Um, and that's, a, I guess, a privilege yeah. that we've been given to, mm-hmm. like God's trusting us mm-hmm. with yes. his children, yeah. Yeah. not they're ours and you'll do as we say. It's yeah. like, no, well, God's trusted us to raise you because you're his son and mm-hmm. you're his daughter and we're simply the people on earth that he's trusted yeah. um, to raise you. Mm-hmm. And so we try to raise them to know his character, who mm-hmm. he is, um, and obviously we try to parent from, mm-hmm. uh, I guess, a... Uh, in a godly way yeah, like, and unconditional love is the other really big one actually we're just like no matter what you do mm-hmm. nothing will make us love you less you know mm-hmm. and that's yeah that's straight from god as well it's straight from yeah. god's heart and it's just like uh, and, and that is a struggle sometimes when they're being a when they've have been a real <laughs> yeah. challenge yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they keep on wanting to choose and you just yeah, 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 yeah. Like, we're not doing it <laughs> But um, but it is. It's really keeping that in mind. It's like unconditional. We love you yeah. no matter what. Mm-hmm. And thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. It's thanks been so fun. Three, three of you guys like some novel questions, probably more so than normal, so I appreciate you taking the time to sort through those. Yep. Cool. Yep. We'll be Thank take you. the time to edit them well. <laughs> <laughs> I will make you look good. Yeah, yeah, that's well, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> make me look better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs>
Hey, I'd just like to talk to you briefly about our youth program that we run um, at Margate Christian Church. It's called Faith Finders and it's uh, designed to be really, really flexible um, because we know um, families are very busy, um, there's lots of stuff going on. So it's basically um, a monthly just fun session and we go out and about, um, we're going to Woody Skate and Play in a few weeks and we'll probably go to the climbing gym soon as well. Um, and it's really just a chance for kids to get together with their own age and, um, and just have a, a lot of fun. Uh, the second aspect of it, um, so that's the one aspect, the second aspect is um, a, a fortnightly study called Dig Deeper and that um, is just a, an opportunity for, for those kids who are interested to really just um, dig into the Bible and, and learn how to get to know God better and, and just share together and, and be together in, in a more reflective kind of place and learn about spirituality and what it's all about. So kids can come just to the monthly events if that's uh, all they're really interested in and if they just want to have fun and, and be together with kids of their own age or they can come just to the fortnightly studies, the Dig Deeper sessions or they can come to both. Um, it's just yeah, whatever works for you guys, for you and your families. It's for grade fives and up. Um, the monthly events we usually ask for at least a, a five dollar donation just to cover costs um, but the the dig deeper studies there completely free. So yeah, that's our Faith Finders program and I hope to see some of you guys coming along to that. Cheers.